Health is very low, it tends to be around 22 to 28%. Leatherbacks is about 42%. So it's high in, uh, in leatherbacks, they're much higher than that. Rate. What that, the net effect is, that means you can carry more oxygen per volume of blood. I don't know, you guys remember the US Olympic cycling team that got in trouble about 10 years ago for something called blood packing? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's really cool. Most people I say that to don't have a clue. Blood packing is where they would take, they would take a, uh, um, they would donate themselves blood, stick it in the refrigerator, sometimes they'd even bubble a little oxygen to it, I guess. And then just before a race, they re-inject it into their bodies. And effectively what that did is that increased the amount of red blood cells, which increases the amount of oxygen your body can carry, which means that you're aerobically better able to perform at a higher level. What got everybody all freaked out was increasing the red blood cells thickens your blood. Your blood thickens, your heart has to work a lot harder to pump that blood. And they were scared to death that high school athletes were going to start doing this who didn't have these very well-trained hearts, and they'd be pumping syrup through their blood and killing themselves. And so, uh, but in the case of things like the back seat turtle, they do it naturally. They have naturally thicker blood than most reptiles. So again, they can carry more oxygen. Yeah, there's all kinds of nifty features. So we've got to have more than a presumably nitric acid accumulation or healthy on more than Yeah. 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 Well, I talked to you more about that because that was my bread and butter when I was in the physiological research lab in Scripps. Yeah, there's all kinds of nifty things that these deep diving animals can do. And one of them is their blood buffering capabilities. Um, Though most of the time they don't allow themselves to become anaerobic, they stay aerobic for a time, so that's another thing. Efficiency. We're talking about leatherbacks move through the water efficiently. Even their swim pattern is designed for much more efficient movement through the water. This is the typical swimming pattern of a green turtle. It's a thrust propulsive type of swimming. They, they thrust down, they feather their flippers, they bring them up, and they thrust again. So they move through the water this way. Actually, it's smooth, but it's a thrust propulsion. Leatherbacks don't use that. They use a, a, a propulsion mechanism that looks more like a hummingbird flight. It's a figure eight, this way. So what they do is they put their flippers out this way, they propel down, then they feather the flipper around this way, and then when they're coming on the upstroke, it's angled this way and they're pulling back. And so they're able to paddle this way. Yeah. Not like Scully? Yes, very much like Scully. Very much the same concept, except it's underwater. <laughs> And, and this kind of scolding means that you're powering on the down and the up. And when you watch a leatherback in the water, it is the most dramatic thing. They're, they're not, well, I shouldn't say dramatic. Graceful is a better term. They're not doing this kind of stuff. They're not stroking. They're just moving their flippers like this. It hardly looks like they're moving them at all. Until you try to swim up and catch up with one, and you realize they're moving along at about two to three miles an hour. And they just glide through the water. So you have this animal with beautiful form. And they're paddling in a very, very efficient manner. Yeah, look at this form. This is the perfect Olympic swimmer design. Big, broad shoulders. They have a skin suit on. Tapers down to a point at the end of the shell. Everything about this turtle is designed for moving through the water efficiently. Look at the size of these paddles. The surface area of this paddle is huge. And it has keels. Where that? It has keels. It, yeah, okay, good, thank you. Um, I'll get there in a minute. <laughs> this is called the perfect hydrodynamic form by folks who work in water systems. The reason it's the perfect hydrodynamic form is the water flows over the object smoothly. If water flows over an object and breaks loose at the end like this, it causes turbulence, which is the effect of, of suction. This suction slows an object down. You pull something like that through the water, it's going to go like this through the water. It's almost as much force as pulling back on it because of this turbulence as pulling forward. So if you can design it so the water doesn't have to break, and it can stay smooth over the object, it moves much better. Look at that shape. That is the perfect hydrodynamic form. Then, keels. This act like keels on a boat. They help you track going forward. In fact, it improves land or flow. Everything goes this way. So you don't have the animal spending a lot of energy being wasted going back and forth. It pulls the water down. They even go so far as to have little bumps on their ridges. And what those bumps do is water is sticky. It likes to hold on to things. Those bumps create a little bit of turbulence just at the surface of the object. And that turbulence breaks that water bond away from your body. So as you're moving through, it's just this very, very thin layer that keeps the water from sticking to your body too hard. It's an amazing, amazingly well-designed animal moving through the ocean. 
It's the perfect form for long distance swimming, but we do need maximum great distances. We didn't. We had some ideas that they did, but we didn't really know it for sure until I started developing this technique, which is satellite telemetry for lead effects. We can actually put satellite transmitters on now. I started doing this in the early 1990s, and that allow us to track a turtle anywhere it goes in the world's oceans. In fact, at any one time, depending on what I'm working on, I can pull from my computer data on, I can be tracking turtles in the Pacific and the Atlantic, and tracking whale sharks down here in the Sea of Cortez, and tracking emperor penguins in the Antarctic, all simultaneously from my laptop using this methodology. It's a fantastic way of marine biologists being able to get out to sea without actually having to get my feet wet. So we can study the turtles using this technique. Now, it's not a GPS technique. That's coming, but we're not able to use GPS yet on wild animals. It's a little bit of different methodology. It uses a little transmitter that has about the same logic as a cell phone, and it transmits it up to a satellite. Like, and then also it'll track the data on depth, temperature, depending on what kind of sensor array we put on these instruments. So this was my very low-tech way of trying to keep Mexican poachers from stealing my satellite. <laughs> 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 this, this tag actually I recovered from a hut in, in Mexico because the guy who killed the turtle taking the tag off. Well, you should have seen the look on his face when I showed up with my Mexican biologist colleagues and two Mexican Marines with their guns. And I looked at the I think you have something that belongs to us. And he was like, no, I don't have anything that belongs to us. I said, well, you know what? Here's a map of your village. Here's a map of where the turtle's transmitter is located from. We know it's in there. We know it's in your back room. And sure enough, there it was. He had it sitting as a doorstop in the back room. <laughs> <laughs> We've been doing this, I've been doing this now since, like, since the early 90s, and we've been tracking turtles from all around the world. Uh, these are some of my colleagues that I'm working with in various places, everywhere from Monterey Bay, California, <coughs> to all of Mexico, the Caribbean. And in fact, last winter I was in downtown Brazil to put down a lot of transmitters out there. So anywhere there are turtles now, I put these transmitters on because now it's giving us the opportunity to understand what's going on way away, not just during the nesting season. Some of the things that we're learning are absolutely phenomenal. Yes, leatherbacks are great distance swimmers. They're averaging about 10,000 kilometers a year, and they come from the whales, like little limbs. These guys are way out swimming. Those that are nesting in Mexico, Costa Rica, migrate down here, and they forage off South America. They'll spend two or three years down here, and then come back up. Those that are nesting here in Indonesia are actually coming over to the California coast to feed, and we're catching them here in Monterey Bay, males, females, and juveniles putting satellite tags on them or tracking them with any this kind of thing going on. So we have leatherbacks doing those kind of swims. In the, in the Atlantic, the pattern looks even more complicated, it sort of is. Uh, this is Trinidad, we're tracking leatherbacks up Trinidad. They're foraging up here and on the west coast of Africa. We're tracking about Florida, and these guys are ranging all over the place. I'm going to Africa, most staying here in the, in the continental slopes of uh, French Guiana. The bottom line is that these things are incredibly good long distance swimmers. Now remember, they, 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 I said they hardly ever stop swimming. They're swimming about 45 to 65 kilometers per day, and they're continually moving through the world's oceans. Now, like I said, between nesting seasons, a female will swim an average of 10,000 kilometers in a single year. Why? Yeah. Why? 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 Why travel those kind of distances? Two primary motivations <coughs> in the leatherback world. One of the things you have to know about, and it's probably the same for most of us, but to feed and to breed. Now, leatherbacks are not highly intellectual creatures. I'm not going really to get the impression that these things are the next flippers. They don't have huge brains. In fact, the brain stem on a fully built leatherback like that one is literally the size of my thumb. Each hemisphere of the brain is about the size of a marble, it's up here, and a little teeny brain stamp with a very, very palatable kind of work on top of it. They really don't have big intellectual capacity. They are just the ultimate design. They don't have to think. Everything is pre-programmed. They're, they're completely instinctive. In fact, I did a project a number of years ago. Um, I used to work out at a research lab near Seal Road in San Diego for about 13 years. And uh, one year we decided that we wanted to release a bunch of the sea world loggerhead sea turtles that came re rehabs from the Pacific. They've been there for 35 years. 
Loggerheads in the Pacific are hatched in Japan. They swim across. To